Hi there, welcome to Boxing Deep Dive. I'm Lyndon Hosking and this is Classic Fights. And this is where we revisit a classic, as it says, uh, from a few years ago and uh, dissect it and um, discuss, debate sometimes uh, about what we think um, of the fight and how it went down. So I'm joined, as always, by my co host uh, Grant Tazzy Brown from Melbourne and Mr. Uh, world Traveller Peter Maniatis, who's up up mm -hmm. there in uh, Sydney. I was going to say Newcastle, but Sydney. Yeah, yeah, steak and kidney. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll spit it out eventually. We had a, the hiccup there with the intro, and now and now me, I can't uh, speak properly. But um, but guys, exciting week, Pete. Before we get onto it, uh, exciting week up there in Sydney for Zoo versus Anui. Yeah, no, he's looking pretty good as well. I mean, he's he's trained hard for it, and uh, they're expecting it to put in a real good fight. And the undercard's good. Wade Ryan's on there. Joel Camilleri's on it. Dennis Hogan. So uh, a real stack night of boxing. They do it well, no limits. Mm, they do it very well. And um, uh, before we get started, of course, uh, we'll shout out to Mike Altamura. Still a little bit crook, but hopefully we'll have him next uh, back next week or the week after. Hopefully, all all the best, Mike. Yeah. I know you're on the mend and. Uh, Sending our best wishes from everyone here at uh, Boxing Deep Dive. You, you, you're missing a cracker tonight, Mikey. You're missing a bloody cracker, mate. Yeah, well, it was yeah, a good get one, well, mate. Um, get well. Yeah, it was a good one last week as well. But Tazzy, you're up this week, mate. And I must admit, when you first said the fight, I was a little bit, oh, okay. But now, I've actually having watched it, talk about classic fights. This is it. Yeah, mate. Oscar De La Hoya, the Golden Boy versus Ike Quarte, Bazooka from Ghana. They were both undefeated to unify the waterway title. So um, this was huge. I mean, Oscar beating Puno Whitaker and captured the waterway title and he wanted to unify and um, on the road to Trinidad, there were three champions, Trinidad, Corte, De La Hoya, all undefeated and all had a title, all three titles. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was a ripper fight, wasn't it, Pete? Um, as I said, I, I must admit when, when, when Tassie first brought it up, I thought I don't really remember much because I'll be honest, I haven't, I watched it um, today, actually, again. I hadn't actually watched it since 1999 when I first watched it live. And I remember it being a, a classic fight. But, um, geez, watching it again today, it was a ripper, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a bit of Leonard versus Hearns it in was. a way. It just had a lot of sparkle to him. Both of them undefeated meant a lot as well. And, um, you know, I caught a, I mean, you know, what can you say? He beat Vince Phillips, a man that beat Costa Zoo as well. And he had good form leading up to it, 34 and zip. And Dillahoy, I think, was 29 and zip. 29 so, and zip, 25 both, KOs, yeah. yeah. They're both undefeated fighters, both at their prime, and just one of the classic fights, really. It really lived up to the hype. Yeah, it did. And, and Tazzy, uh, you know, uh, Corte, like, he was a little bit not as heralded as some of the other opponents that De La Hoya fought uh, before and after. But, geez, uh, on the night, it was a little bit controversial. We'll obviously get into that after we've watched it. But, geez, he gave De La Hoya one of his, his greatest fights. Yeah, look, he was, um, you know, a really, really strong fight. He had a great left jab. Obviously, a real pistol sort of like left mm. jab. He was tough. He could punch. I mean, he never had the hype of a De La Hoya, but he was a, a dangerous opponent, as I said. And I remember at the time, De La Hoya chasing him and, and getting about and then obviously I know he wanted to unify and then fight Trinidad so this was a tough test and I don't know if it was if Dillahoy would know it was going to be this tough as it was but yeah it proved to be a great a great a great fight yeah it did and uh going into the fight uh Pete so for the WBC welterweight title um as we said just before it was uh, Thomas and Max Center you've been there obviously before Pete for, and uh 1999 yep. both undefeated and as I said, it wasn't as heralded as a lot of the other fights that he had, but um, it's, it's definitely one. Of, you know, he's one of his most memorable. You know, we've just touched on the type of opponent Corte was, but the fight itself was definitely as, as memorable as a lot of his other classics. It was. Look, Corte because he was from Ghana and he wasn't really uh, well known. You know, to the boxing circles he was, but he wasn't a mainstream guy. But his performances were first class leading up to that fight. I mean, everyone expected this to be a real dangerous fight that it was. And it's just that Corte was an American. They didn't really know what was going on with him. So that's why it didn't get the hype it deserved. Yeah, Tazzy, do you know, uh, just a, a little bit of a thing I was going to ask you. Um, it was, Corte was the WBA champion, but it was only for the WBC title. Yeah, you know what happened I, there? I, I didn't know that. So it wasn't... Wasn't his title on the line? No, it was for the WBC mm. uh, title. Because I thought it was a unification. Cause no. 
No, Trinidad wasn't. had the IBF. Mm. Trinidad had the IBF. So I yep. thought this was. Yeah, I always well, thought it was unification. It, he won it against uh, Vince. No, sorry, Andrew. No, hang on. I'll keep going back through. I'm on box rec at the moment, going through it. So you probably know this. But Chris uh, Espana, he won it from. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Defended against Alberto Cortez, Bobby. Uh, no, he didn't do it. Jung Ho Park, Andrew Murray, Vince Phillips, uh, and also Overcar, Ralph Jones, Jose Luis Lopez was yeah, the draw, the, and then he went car. into this fight with De La Hoya. But it's only for the um, WBC welterweight title. So, do you know the background okay. at all? Yeah. No, no, no but um, I, I think um, you know. Leading into it, though, it, as you said, it wasn't like a massively big title, big fight thing. But at the time, it still was a massive fight for the real purists mm. because I gave Corte a real massive chance in this fight. And I mean, Tassie, when he picked it, I thought, you beauty, because it gave me a chance to go and watch the fight again. Because all I can remember was the knockdowns. Mm. So, I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. So Tazzy, uh, De La Hoya was coming off the the Chavez, uh, I think the second Chavez fight. Um, he'd beaten in the lead up to it, uh, Ch- uh, Patrick uh, Charpentier, I think that's the the, the word for it. Alfredo Rivera, Victor Camacho, yeah. the Pernell Whitaker, uh, obviously uh, Chavez again, Miguel um, Angel Gonzalez, so and uh, Jesse James Blazer. So he had a, a great lead into it. But um, who would have thought that Corte would have been the one that would have troubled him the most? Yeah, I mean, um, I think like some of the names you just mentioned, Chavez, Whitaker, Hector Camacho probably weren't in their prime. So yeah. Yeah. he's fighting a young, undefeated, hungry guy from Ghana that believes in himself So and a, a fellow champion. So I think that was probably the difference of fighting a, a fellow undefeated young fo- As I said, three young guns, him, mm. Corte and Trinidad, all yeah. at the one time. All in the one division. It's, then, it's, it's um, absolutely amazing. And then within 12 months, you had Shane Mosley uh, into the mix as well. So he uh, obviously created a bit of havoc there. He, for, well, he jumped up. Yeah, but he fights Trinidad after this, though, doesn't he? Yeah, he does, yeah. So after this, yep. uh, he fought over Carr and then uh, lost to Trinidad and then a couple of fights later lost to Shane Mosley for the Let, let me just say something. Over Obar, Obar Carr is one of the best fighters never to win a world title. Yep. He fought Trinidad, Corte, De La Hoya. He fought all the top guys from um, Detroit. An absolute weapon, but it was just a little bit under the, the very top top. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now, well, uh, let's get into the the fight itself. Uh, we've got plenty to discuss afterwards, I think, because I think we might all have varying opinions of of the actual decision. We'll obviously go into the the official scorecards, and then we can have a bit of a chat about it. So here is uh, De La Hoya versus Ike Corte. Round one from Las Vegas. I must admit, guys, um, right off the word, uh, off the bat, I don't know what's happened to Pete there. I'm sure we'll be, we'll be back there. But um, the De La Hoya was very pensive, Tazzy. Like, it wasn't his usual. And so was uh, Corte, to be honest. I suppose that happens when you get two really good fighters fight each other. But uh, De La Hoya was very cautious. And uh, Corte, according to the commentators, only threw about half as many punches in the first few rounds per round than what he normally does. Yeah, I guess um, not the biggest fight of their career, so I guess a bit of a feel that process. But I mean, um, I think Oscar started a bit quicker than Corte, obviously. But yeah, I think such a big fight, you know. Even at that top level, as you know, Lindy, you still get nerves. Yeah, exactly. And you can and you see there that again, as I said, when you get two gun fighters like this fighting each other, you're uh, they're always going to be a bit cautious. But it was um, surprising, Pete, that. Probably almost for the whole fight, bar a few exchanges, probably the most uh, cautious that I've ever seen De La Hoya. Because you know what he gets like? He tends to get very emotional and starts winging them from everywhere. And it wasn't until the last last round that we'll see that he really uh, let himself go. For the rest of the fight, he's actually quite, um, quite cautious. Yeah, they mentioned his training camp wasn't the best it could have been. Yep. So he's having problems in his training camp. And when Oscar was fighting big names, and then to fight someone like Corte, who wasn't a big name, but at his prime, who's probably more dangerous than other guys he was fighting, but you're not going to get the recognition for beating him. It was probably hard for him to get up for the, not hard to get up, but the fact that, you know, he's gone from Whitaker, Chavez and all these guys that were career defining to a, basically a relatively known 
African gun fighter yeah. that said he's prime. He, his training camp wasn't what it should have been, and, it, and you could see here, he, it's, he's just lacking a little bit that he normally has with, with a crispy punching as well. Yeah, I was just going to say that too, Tazzy. It must be hard because De La Hoya was one of these fighters like a Pacquiao, like a Mayweather, these types of guys that every single fight they have a massive event. And to come up against a fighter like Corte that's a massive threat and a very, very good fighter, it can be hard for these guys to, to get themselves up for someone like that. Yeah, every fight Oscar had was box office. Mm. It was, you know, a, a Hollywood show. But De La Hoya, as you know, at the time, was boxing at, that, at this time. Um... Like Pete said, training camps. He trains. He trains so many trainers. I just wish I could sit down with Oscar one day and ask him, why? Why did you? Why did you have so many trainers? Why did you always have to change things? You were so awesome. What did you need to change? I, you just all these different Gil Clancy and his original trainer and then Manuel and yeah. Well, I was just going to say that, mate. In this in this fight, you've got um, he had his uh, and I can't remember his, his the trainer's name, but. Um, you had Gil Clancy in the corner, but he wasn't actually part of the official, you know, training camp. He, he's just an advisor in the corner. So, I, Peter, you can probably... I, I struggle to see how... And I think during the telecast, George Foreman actually commented that Angelo Dundee used to do the same with him. He wouldn't have anything to do with his training camp. And there's the first knockdown there in the sixth first round. But, so yeah. He wouldn't have anything to do with the training camp and then rock up on, on fight night and be an advisor in the corner. Very, very odd. Yeah, some guys are just speakers, mouthpieces, where they're good in on fight night. They can pick things and they can say the right things at the right time. And um, obviously, he was that, that guy that does that. You, you, you know, normal mouthpieces, you call them. Mm. You can see here. Yeah, I like his first trainer. Yeah. Yeah, I like here, the that. guy in his corner, his original trainer from the pros. I sort yeah. of, I, don't know, I think his dad controlled everything. Mm. A very hard man, I think, Oscar's dad. Beautiful. So now yeah. he's dropped now, Oscar. Beautiful hook there from Corte. And also got in a bit of trouble here when he got dropped. He did, and it was a like he did look, touch, wasn't it? He looked it was uncomfortable. A, it, was a, it was a short, sharp hook. Um, you know, it was all pure timing in, rather than yeah. power. In between his punches, too. Mm. So you could see Oscar here a little uncomfortable having a hold. Mm. Mitch Alpin gives him the old, oh, you're on the B side. I'll give this bloke a bit of a breather. Yeah, just Don't you I'll miss like that when seconds. they do that? <laughs> yeah. I've seen that happen to Melvin. I've seen, I've seen that at Melvin Town Hall a few times on your shows, Pete. <laughs> I bet they happen in Tasmania too, down at the Town Hall there, Tassie. Don't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Good comeback. Good comeback. Yeah. Good comeback. <laughs> but, uh, it's not quiz night, Tassie. We yeah. need to relax. We're going to have to be uh, going at each other all the time. In, in hindsight, You're on holiday. In hindsight, in hindsight this fight was, um, it was a good, really, really well fought and advised by Corte. I thought that he, he'd been known for actually um, burning out or gassing out late in fights. And he was used to um, throwing 85 to 90 punches around. So it was interesting. He was only throwing about half of that. And it really held him in good stead, Pete, that he, um, in the later rounds, uh, he didn't fade. Yeah, well said, Lyndon, exactly right. But the thing I've noticed here as well, Corte was kind of throwing a few chopping punches and hitting De La Hoya at the back of the head and stuff like that in awkward places. And that that would be yeah. uncomfortable for De La Hoya as well, being hit at the back of the head. Yeah. Yeah, he's, been, he's unorthodox. Oh, yeah, as a lot of the yeah. African fighters are. But did you think yeah. watching it, Tazzy, that... And I must admit, I did that around this time in eight, uh, the eighth round here that the fight was getting away from Oscar. Oh, uh, look, I remember watching it at the casino live. What year did you say it was? 99? 99, yeah. February. So, look, I never really thought Oscar was in trouble. I thought it was a close fight and, and that. But I, 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 at the time, I, I look, I, I always seem to think Oscar was always going to win it. I don't really... I, don't, I was never really troubled that much, but I was a bit concerned. But I was a massive Oscar fan back then, so yeah. you would have had to knock Oscar out, in my opinion, to beat him. Well, I think that's what uh, Cortez camp thought too, didn't they, Pete? Because I don't think they were ever that confident in getting the decision. And I suppose in a close fight like this, you know, the, 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 the house fight is always going to uh, have the upper hand, isn't he? Oh, well, when you've got the cash cow in front of you, and he was a massive cash cow, it's a close fight. You don't have to be Einstein to work out which way it's going to go. 
Yeah. Yeah. He's the biggest, the biggest lower, like not Tyson, but the biggest smaller fighter since Ray Leonard, I think. Yeah. That really be a, a bloody superstar, you know? Mm. But, you know, I always say this, a champion closes a show. Yeah. And this fight and was up in the air, and we'll see pretty soon what makes the difference between, you know, a guy that just sneaks through and, and cops a lot of co controversy. I mean, was it enough even to do what he did to to the way it went? We'll, we'll keep talking about that yeah, a bit we'll later. But, of course. Yeah. But, I, I but we could see now that... Yeah, sorry, go ahead, mate. Oscar's starting to put the, you know, the, the pedal to the metal now, and he knows he has to finish strong. He definitely knows that. He knows this fight could go against him, and he has to, you know, bite on the mouth guard and really start going for it. Yeah, and that's what he's doing. But it's interesting watching, you know, watching in between rounds to him in between a few that De La Hoya came back shaking his head. And his trainers are telling him, you know, you've got to pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. So I just got the impression even he knew he might be in a bit of trouble. But, you know, end of the day, oh. Oh, the bang. Round, this is the 12th round, yeah. Last round. First 15 seconds. And he did that a lot, didn't he, uh, Oscar? He always finished strong. Yeah. And that is what he makes Corte pay for. Left hand down low, right hand. Well, and you see that Corte actually landed a hook at the same time. So I think it was just a matter of who yeah. landed the... Yeah, but yeah, Cortez was short and Oscars was long. The long one's always going to land. Yeah, and he dropped a lot of fighters like that, didn't he, Tazzy, with that, that sort of counter left hook, didn't he? That's his, it's his yeah. trailer, because he's original, originally a southpaw. Oh, okay. So yeah. his, his left hook's amazing, yeah. I read his um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he is. And he was probably about two seconds away from getting stopped here, Cortez. Look at the, the referee. Yeah. A couple of times he almost jumped in. Yeah, but I you could have stopped him. Mm. Right you could have known it's that close. Yeah, yeah. He's still throwing. That's the thing. He's still throwing. Exactly. You couldn't stop that. Ooh. Unless of course they the thought gas he was is right out behind. Here. A little nudge, nudge, wink, wink to the referee. <laughs> yeah. No, but he's he's catching and throwing. So how can you stop it when you know possibly he's won the fight as well? Yeah. It's probably about What's the time name? where you think that De La Hoya's thinking, well, I've got the 10-8 round. Hopefully, it'll just be enough and I'll just hang on because he barely threw a punch in the last minute. Yeah. Richard still probably would have Richard still probably would have stopped it. <laughs> probably. <laughs> you see there, he's like, yeah, I think I'll just take my chances on a 10-8 round and hope the judges uh, have my back. Yeah. yeah. And Oscar's eye was really, really swollen, wasn't it, from the right hands? Yeah. There it is. So 115-112 is the... So there it is. So Oscar by split decision. Well, the official scorecards were one... I've got them here. 115-114 for Ike Corte. 116-113 for De La Hoya. And 116-112. I must admit, I had it the same way as the first judge. I had it 115-114. For Ike Corte, I thought he did enough even with the last uh, round 10 8. I thought that De La Hoya didn't really do enough uh, during the fight um, uh, to win the fight. But having said that, we are talking about Oscar De La Hoya in a close fight. Um, and it was close, a lot of close rounds, but I, I personally thought that it was seven rounds to five and a 10 8 round in that last round. How'd you have it, Tazzy? Yeah, I had it, I think, as a second judge there. So what was that? One one sixteen, one thirteen. So you thought he had it well the truly won before the last round? Yeah. Okay. Yep. What about you, Pete? No, I I thought he needed a knockdown to win it. Yeah. yeah. I had him around down in the eleventh. Mm. So, you know, if he just had a one at ten nine, it, it would have probably been a draw for mine, but the knockdown gives it to him by a point. Yeah, it was it was a close like a really close fight and it was so many close rounds. That's why I mean it's hard to argue with anyone's opinion, I suppose. I do, I, I actually, I, I will take um, I'm to the last judge who had it eight rounds to four. I don't think it was anywhere near that that wide. Yeah. But again, you've got the Oscar De La Hoya factor as well. And uh, I've got no doubt, obviously. And look, it's just human nature that the... the Probably just fighters. gave a lot of those close rounds to Oscar, yeah. I guess, the champion. And, yeah, you know, exactly. Like, yeah. 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 Look, I thought, Corte, look, 
Watching the fight again, I mean, at the time, I thought, like you guys said, I thought it was close, but the last round got Oscar over the line. But watching it back the second time, I thought Corte did. But I just I felt really bad for Corte because he fought a great fight right up to that last round. And, you know, um, you know that last round really you know, tipped it on its head and, and gave Oscar um, the decision. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it really felt for him because he, he fought the fight of his life, didn't he, Tazzy? Yeah, mate. He, um, I mean, he was probably the best fighter from Ghana since Zuma Nelson. And he was very, very, very popular. Um, mm. You know, and he, I think he fought um, well, Fernando Vargas as yeah. well later, Mickey Wright. And, yeah, he was a yeah, great, well, great fighter, of course, eh? Yeah, well, Corte, was... after this, lost to Fernando Vargas uh, for the IBF Super yeah. Lightweight title. Um, he then he didn't really do a lot after that. He had three more wins against sort of no names, and then lost his last two fights against Vernon Forrest and, and Winky Wright, and that was sort of the end of him. Whereas Oscar, I mean, just he had he had a lot of big fights left him after. After of course, he had the two Mosey fights. He had a Turo Gatti, uh, Vargas, Felix Stern, Bernard Hopkins, uh, Mayweather, Mayweather Pacquiao, Mayweather, Mayweather Pacquiao, Pacquiao, and throw Steve Forbes in there as well in between. So. He had some pretty big fights after that, but um, yeah, it was uh, it was probably one of those turning points for him, wasn't it, Pete? That he uh, he got the close decision and, and obviously went on to bigger and better things. Yeah, the show rolled on. He had a bit of a hiccup, a bit of a dint in the wagon, but got back on the highway and it kept rolling on. And like Corte, after his first loss in his career, seemed to suffer a bit from that, and obviously moved up in weight as well. So, but look. That, that's boxing, I guess, isn't it? Some people cop a loss a bit better, some don't. Obviously, that might have psychologically done something to him because he got dropped twice in that mm. fight as well. Yeah. So it was a brutal fight for him. But a, a great pick, Tazzy. That was a great pick. Your go, I think, this week, Lyndon, for the next uh, classic is it my fights. Pick or is it your pick? No, Pete's was last no, no, week. No, I, I, I picked Holyfield Tyson. Oh, is that right? Okay. Well, I must admit, I, yeah. the, the I first admit, one. I haven't actually. Uh, no, I did. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just going to say I haven't really uh, got anything um, well, on my mind. Actually, it's probably Mike's turn, of course, so, and he's not, he's not here. So yeah. I'll have a bit of a think about it during the week, guys, and well, I've got a week to think about. Have it, a think course. about it, Lyndon. Have a think I'll about it. I'll come up it, with mate. a good one. I was pretty happy with the last one. I put a lot of effort into the Barry Michael um, Lester Ellis fight. Uh, actually, that was we, good. While we're on the uh, the Aussie part of it. And this will be right up your alley, I reckon, Tassie, because you were actually part of it. Let's go back to Anthony Mundine, Danny Green won the first fight, back to 2006, and revisit Ooh. that fight. I think... Uh, look, okay. I think more so than the result itself, because uh, Chalk won a pretty lopsided decision, but I think it's more the event and the build-up and the aftermath and the fight itself... Uh, sorry, not the fight itself, rather than everything around it. What do you think, Taz? Most... Anticipated fight in Australian history, built up for over five years. People, pubs were packed all over Australia. I think there was a death in a pub in Perth. I was at the I was there yeah. at the Wayne and the and, and the you venue. You walked in with Chuck, didn't you? No, no. I thought I, I thought I saw you I'll be, in. I'll be honest with you. Back then, I didn't know Chuck that well. I knew his dad. I knew Danny Green really well through being yep. with Team Fennec. I mean, mm -hmm. me and Danny turned pro at the same time. So, so I, I went Green. to the lane and I wasn't, I wasn't Team anyone. But I was there. But I'm just saying I didn't really – I knew Greeny more than I knew Chuck. Obviously, now, I'm, you know, Chuck's like a, a brother to me, yep. like family. But, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you then. Um, I was there with Luke Jackson. We just sat there and, you know, watched a great fight. But, I mean, it was so much anticipation – Mm. Nothing like it, and I think there ever will be anything like it in Australia. It was this off its head? Yeah, well, that's what I was saying, Pete. Rather than the fight itself, which was pretty one-sided in the end, because Chuck gave uh, Danny a, a boxing lesson, but the the build-up and you know the aftermath—it was just a, a massive Australian event. Now we obviously spoke a couple of weeks ago about uh, Barry Michael Lester Ellis about the build-up and all that of that fight, and and this is probably the the biggest Aussie fight since then, I think, and probably going to be the bit one of the probably the biggest Aussie fight ever. It's going to be hard to top. Yeah, no, the great pick, Lyndon. It's going to be good talking about it because even though Chuck did win, it was still a very competitive fight, and and yeah. Danny tried his heart out, but it'd be good to relive that next week. Mm, so many. Um, yeah, it was so, so much, and it wasn't just a fight. 
it was about race as well, white versus yeah. black. It really yeah. was. As much as we yeah. hate um, it. was about yeah, it was about corporate mm. corporate sort of versus, you know, the, I mean, you know, Chock's always been outspoken against the sort of the, the system. Yeah. Green is a bit more of a corporate man. There so many aspects and most people believe Danny was just gonna knock him out. Mm. People didn't give Mundine a chance. I mean, yet to be a Mundine supporter. Yeah. I mean, and it was a big shock and it was a big shock to a lot of people. Mm. Yeah, no, it certainly was. Well, I must admit, I didn't. I was overseas when this fight was on, so I had to watch the the replay. But I just remember the the build up to it. It was just absolutely massive. And you're right, Tazzy. Every pub and club in Australia, because I think that was just before the Oz Star Foxtel thing with the pay per views and all that sort of stuff. And I think um, it cost a fortune to put it on. But yeah, they would have got the money back. Yeah, I think they split ten mil. Yeah. I think it was six That's four right. Mundine or Grant. I think yeah. it was big, big time money yeah, let- out of footy. At a footy oval, mm. and um, everyone watched it. On that night, no one was not watching that fight. Women, people that didn't care about boxing, old ladies, anyone was watching that fight that night. Yeah, and it's very, very rare to get a fight like that. But, Pete, was that was that probably one of the first stadium fights in Australia of, of modern times? I, I, can't, I can't remember another one. Yeah, and I remember an interview just before the fight because South Sydney, they play a lot of rugby games mm. there. And uh, it fits, I think, 35,000. I think they play soccer games too. It's right next to the SCG. And yep. I remember Chuck Anthony Mundine walking on here and he looked around and he said, oh, I scored many great tries on here mm. and I'm going to kick Danny Green's butt on here as well. <laughs> and that sort of made me think, he's not scared of the venue. He's been here in front of big crowds. Yeah. He's conquered it. He's not going to be and... overwrought. Yep. Yeah, he's not going to be overwrought. He yeah. likes the outdoor environment too. Mm. A lot of fighters fighting outdoors to indoors, completely different with a wing coming, this and that. I mean, Pacquiao, you know, against Horn, I just didn't think he handled it, that cold uh, type of morning type of weather where yeah. if you've been outdoors and you've played sports, soccer, footy, and you're used to that outdoor environment, it's completely different air. It's completely different. The sun's there, some, the wind's blowing. Completely, completely different environments. Mm. Yeah. It probably was the first since Fennec and Nel- Zuma Nelson, wouldn't it yeah, be? Yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. 92 yeah. was, um, in Melbourne, yeah, of course. March, two, March, March 12, two, I think. Two Australians doing it, is there. Well, yeah. we'll talk about it next week, though, anyway. Yeah, plenty to talk about. Yeah. Hopefully, okay. hopefully, Mike's back to talk about it because um, he was actually old enough to remember this one, unlike Barry Michael and, uh, and Lester Alice. He was only a, a little... Uh, yeah, he's only a little... Show. Little kid, Mike. He still is a little kid. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully Mike's back next week. Again, all the best, Mike. I hope so. and, um, thanks again, guys. That was Oscar De La Hoya versus Ike Corte. Um, and we'll see you next week for Mundine Green 1. Thanks, guys. Cheers.